Today we have with us a remarkable, extraordinary, wonderful personality and icon in India, Ms. Barka Dutt. Let's give her a big round of applause. She has always been on the front line in more ways than one. And it's a pleasure to have her here with us in conversation with Ms. Moria Boda. This event has been organized by Prabha Kaitan Foundation in association with ITC Kohinoor. Before proceeding further, allow me to say a few lines about Prabha Kaitan Foundation. It's a non-profit trust based in Kolkata. It was established by the late Dr. Prabha Kaitan, an eminent literature enthusiast, philanthropist, social worker, and industrialist. Prabha Kaitan Foundation began a glorious journey as a Kolkata-based non-profit trust, encouraging literary and cultural heritage back in the 1980s. Guided by the philosophies and policies of the founder, Dr. Prabha Kaitan, the foundation has achieved stellar heights in creating a cultural capital through landmark initiatives and activities. It's been on a continual journey since then, and all the initiatives have become landmark events that enjoy a unique identity and niche audience. Prabha Kaitan Foundation is dedicated to the all-round development of the social, cultural, and humanitarian aspects of Indian society. The foundation endorses basic humanitarian approach towards the needs and the rights of the masses. And the foundation supports the UNESCO view. And today we have with us former director of education of UNESCO, Dr. Azkar Hussain himself from Paris. So the UNESCO view that staunchly believes in the cultural, in cultural development as the potential to bear an alternative way of promoting and promoting sustainable development of poor, poor rural communities, especially in third world countries. India is a land of multiple assets, be it literary jewels, art and cultural treasures, ethnic handlooms, crafts, or delightful local cuisine. It is this rich heritage that Prabha Kaitan Foundation has always aimed to protect from day one until now. The foundation is a die-hard custodian of the diverse heritage of India. The foundation has been raising awareness and strongly encouraging and protecting the cultural assets of India under the aegis of literary, art, and culture verticals for the past four decades. Every initiative of the foundation presented by the patron Siri Cement Limited is bolstered by the support and cooperation of distinguished associates, partners, collaborators, and SAS Women of India. We have 40 such initiatives throughout the country. And in Hyderabad, it is myself, Ms. Moria Boda, and Ms. Mansi Malik as your SAS Women here, representing the foundation. The collaborative ventures facilitate the foundation's implementation of various cultural, educational, literary, and social welfare, pro welfare projects throughout the country and abroad. To widen the cultural spectrum, Prabha Kaitan Foundation leaves no stone unturned to exchange cross-city mementos, treat chief guests and audiences to the taste of authentic local cuisine, and appreciate the handloom and sculpture work of local artisans when it's time to show appreciation to our esteemed personalities. The anthem of Prabha Kaitan Foundation, which was playing as you walked in, deserves a special mention here. The anthem portrays a beautiful philosophy of the nation, unity in diversity. And this is also something that's very close to my heart. Today, I am delighted to welcome the legendary Ms. Barka Dutt in conversation with Moria Boda in our Right Circle session. 
Barakadat is a stellar figure in the world of journalism and needs no introduction. But let me say a few words still. She is a well-acclaimed Indian broadcast journalist who is famous for frontline news reporting from the toughest spots in the world, including war zones and insurgencies. She became a household name with her daredevil media coverage of the Kargil War from the war grounds itself. She is a person whose passion has always won over fears, be it the Kargil War, the tsunami, the 2611 terrorist attack. She has done a stellar job in fearless news reporting. Barka Dutt is a featured opinion columnist in the Washington Post and Hindustan Times. She has received numerous national and international awards, including the Padmashri. She is the founder editor of the YouTube news channel, Mojo Story, an independent multimedia digital platform that covers media stories courageously, compassionately, and creatively. Her channel has been recognized twice as the best digital channel in India in 2021, and 2022. Most recently, she spent two years traveling throughout India, reporting on the pandemic, covering 30,000 kilometers by road. She chronicled the COVID-19 migration crisis, the biggest exodus of migrant workers all over North India, and the humanitarian crisis that hit India in her book, humans of COVID to hell and back. Her vivid recording of the human story of the pandemic spans the two dread 19. Conversationalist Ms. Moria Boda is an SS woman of Hyderabad and she is the director of Prairit Infrastructure and Pro Infrastructure Private Limited. So before we start today's conversation, once again, a reminder to please switch off your mobile phones or keep them on silent mode. It is now time to start the session. So let's sit back and enjoy the session. Over to you, Moria. Let's give a big round of applause to welcome Ms. Varka Dutt. Hi, Barka. It's uh, wonderful to have you here. I know like you don't need any introduction. You've always been a frontliner when it comes to news reporting, be it Kargil War or Tsunami, like COVID-19. The list of journalistic experience you had were really immense. So I'll just take a question. How, what drove you to journalism? Well, um, to be honest, I grew up as the daughter of a very revolutionary journalist, also a woman. Her name was Prabhadat. My mother died when I was 13, and I was raised along with my sister by my father, who we also lost to COVID last year. But I grew up hearing stories of how when my mother at 19 walked into the Hindustan Times to apply for a job, she was told that women are not allowed to cover mainstream stories, and if you want to work here, the most you'll be allowed to cover is the flower show in the city. So she took the job anyway, and then bit by bit by bit, like other women of her generation at that time, she fought and she rose to become the head of the newsroom. The other interesting thing about uh, her and my history, therefore, is that in 1965, when India and Pakistan went to war, uh, my mother then was an established head of the newsroom at the Hindustan Times. And she wanted to go and cover the war. And her editor told her that women cannot be sent to the front line. So this is not possible. And she said, if you're not going to let me cover the biggest story that there is right now, then give me a chutti, de do, I'll go on holiday. So she pretended that she was going on vacation. And at that time, there was no television. There was only newspapers. So she took a notepad and a pen. She went to the war front herself alone. She had a cousin in the army. And she started reporting the war. So while many people have called me India's first woman war correspondent, that was actually my mom. 
And because I grew up with such a strong role model and one that I lost so early in life, I think it was one, I always had a rebel streak. I always wanted to break rules. I always wanted to do something radical and revolutionary. And I think I got that energy from her. And that, you know, that was in a way what had shaped me very early on as a child. When I was five years old, my parents used to show me the cover of Time magazine and make me identify world leaders. So that's the kind of childhood I had. So I think news was destined for me, though, of course, I must confess that I have one unfulfilled dream. And that is that if I hadn't been a journalist, I would have been a lawyer. And I still keep thinking sometimes that maybe I'll sit for the law exam, but I don't know. It, it looks a bit scary. One, once I even went and picked up the question papers and I looked at them and I was like, what do any of these questions have to do with law? I don't know if there are any lawyers in this room, but the entrance exams have become so absurd that they'll ask you things like, you know, who won which, like in Beijing Olympics, who won gold for table tennis, etc., which I have no idea of. So I then decided not to take the exam. But yes, so journalism, almost genetic. Um, early exposure and um, and yeah I think it was destined for me. So you had an amazing coverage braving the hardships and impending dangers associated with the frontliner war reporting right? Yeah. So could you just take us to those days of Kargil days especially your interview with the late captain uh, Vikram Batra on whose biopic Shersha uh, enjoyed resounding success in the recent times. Yes. So Shersha, uh, uh, how many of you have seen Shersha? So some of you have. So Shersha ends with a clip, an actual news footage, where you can see this young man. He was only in his mid-20s and he's uh, sitting under in a tent and he throws his head back and he laughs. And I ask him, Aapko dar nahi lagta, aren't you scared? And he says, Dar ye dil mange more. And, and that became, that was a Pepsi ad, by the way, at that time. But he just used it and made it kind of like a national slogan, as it were. So to rewind, I guess, um, when Kargil uh, war broke out between India and Pakistan, I was uh, just a little over 26 years old. And I had just returned from Columbia University, where I had done my second master's. And I hadn't reported much. In fact, I had no exposure to the military, no exposure to war, nothing. And then, like my mother, like they say, history is condemned uh, to repeat itself. When this war erupts, I'm sitting in Delhi and I'm like, what am I doing sitting in Delhi? Why am I in Delhi when the war is happening up in the high Himalayas? And then I had to go through a very similar struggle to the one that my mother had gone through. I had to convince first my organization, but then I had to convince the military. And the military said there's no way. You know, today we have women flying fighter, you know, they're fighter jet uh, pilots, they're uh, on warships, they're, you know, they're, they're landing on aircraft carriers, all of that. But at the time that I'm talking about, there were no women in infantry. And it was a very all-male zone. This war zone was an all-male zone. And it was designed only for men. And what I mean by that is the army said to me, quite simply, there's going to be no room for you to sleep. There is no guaranteed food. And there is no bathroom. And they were really worried about this fact. Like, you know, sometimes when you look back at like, what was the biggest reason they gave you to not send you to the front? It was like, there are no loose. So what will you do? And I said, I, they said, we can't give you any special treatment. So I said, I don't need any special treatment. I'll, you know, I'll do what the guys do. I'll go in the cave. I'll go behind it. Army, the army trucks had giant tires so you could go and hide behind them. And I was like, I understand I'm going into a war zone. Now I said this, but of course I'd never gone into a war zone. So I had no idea what I was in for. Please also remember, we can't imagine it today when everyone with a mobile phone is a broadcast journalist. But in the days that I covered the Kargil war, mobile phones were uh, blocked in Jammu and Kashmir. They were not allowed. There was no broadcast vans. There were no satellite vans. And one of the biggest challenges, the biggest challenge after somehow finding a way to remain alive, the second biggest challenge was how do you get the footage back to Delhi? So... We would go, there were four of us who formed a group, three guys and me, and we would walk kilometers on the national highway, you know, breathing and hiding from, like, basically shells that were filing from the, uh, falling from the Pakistani side. And we would go to these helipad places where choppers would be taking off with the bodies of our soldiers, with the coffin bags. And we would then go and we would beg the 
pilots can you please take our tapes because those days everything was shot on tape and that's how we would get our our footage back and you know i feel that a lot of other reporters especially the men they were very focused on this is the bofors gun this is the multi barrel rocket launcher this is the ammunition and i was really interested in finding out what what are these men going through they were 2 years most men i met at the front line were 2 years younger than me they were 24 23 some had broken engagement some had were about to get married some had just become parents you know some had just fallen in love and you know they were we we forget that every conflict has human beings in it human beings right and i would then talk to them about these things you know what is the nature of fear uh, how vulnerability can coexist with courage how vulnerability is a key part of courage and i always say people always say you know barkha you're so fearless and i always say no i'm not fearless i find that everybody has fear but what happens is that something larger than fear takes over you and it displaces whether it's adrenaline whether it's survival whether it's just where are you going to stay the night today um whether it's how to send the footage back something larger consumes you and it displaces the fear and you know we've spoken about kargil but actually something very similar happened to me in covid i remember uh, when the lockdown was announced i live in delhi and i just went to the border of delhi to see on the first day of the lockdown what is happening and i saw men women little children one little parle ji glucose biscuits in their hand a little bottle of water if they were lucky no money walking and they were not hundreds they were in the thousands and i understood that something very big is about to happen and i understood just like i had felt in kargil that in kargil i felt i can't sleep at night if i'm not there and during covid i felt i can't sleep at night if i'm not there and it's the same impulse that when something so large happens to a country to a people you can't be safe because you didn't sign up to be a journalist so that you could sit in a studio in the safety of your home or your office then you shouldn't have been a journalist so for me both kargil and covid were like life tests of what kind of journalist i could be and i am moving to your recent book humans of covid to helen back what was your call to write the book covid-19 migration crisis the biggest humanitarian crisis ever in india you have chronicled the greatest departure of the migrant workers all over north india and you've covered stories of lost jobs dying business and children pulled out from school which are heart wrenching for all of us so you know it's very similar to how i was telling you that in the war i wanted to bring to people's homes the understanding of who our soldiers were as humans so that has always been my compelling passion as a storyteller that i one bridge the gap between my audience and my readers and something very difficult that's happening somewhere which they can't access and i'm that bridge but more than that I hate reporting on people as if they're numbers or as if they're just a symbol of something right so I couldn't cover the war without humanizing the soldier without giving names you know Vishal uh, uh, Vikram Batra there was a captain Vishal and so on so if you pull out my Kargil stories you'll you'll notice that everybody has a name and humans of covid is something similar uh, I believe that this these two years changed all of us we don't want to remember it today because who wants to remember something sad and every time i talk about my book i i always say i know people may say nahi i don't want to read this because i don't want to remember the, those bad times but this is not a book about the virus this is a book about us this is a book about we the people this is a book about our country this is a book about heartbreak yes but it's also a book about hope this is a book about you know and a journey that i don't think i'll ever get to do again i don't know how many of you know that once i left delhi so in the beginning i would go to a place please remember there was no place to stay there was no food to eat even on the highways no dhabas were open not even a glucose biscuit dukan in the initial period i'm talking about and there was no public transport so the only way we could travel was by road 
and initially we would go somewhere we would go maybe drive to 10 hours 12 hours and then drive back spend the night in the car because we didn't know where to stay and then i said you know this can't be done like this i have to just go and so i left delhi and once i left delhi i didn't come back till i hit the south in kerala i drove up and down by the way through uh, through hyderabad thrice so i just kept driving wherever i could sort of go and i would literally it was raw reality and what i found was that in the midst of all that sorrow the suffering and in the second wave of course the airports were open so i was able to fly but i was still traveling all across the country i also found extraordinary compassion in people you know you see our tv news and you would think people are always fighting it's not like that in life right in life i can tell you the story of a man called abdul malbari who ran a small trust called the ekta manch and he had a one ambulance just one ambulance and on that ambulance were written the words funerals for lonely humans and his life was committed to performing the last rites of those who didn't have anyone and in covid a lot of people from fear and stigma abandoned even families abandoned bodies right so abdul malbari would go irrespective of whether you were hindu or muslim he would go and perform the last rites in bangalore i met a hindu man worked in the it sector his wife was 6 months pregnant when she died from covid the baby had to be extracted because it was a stillborn child now this man had a 9 year old daughter and he didn't have the heart to tell his daughter that your mother has died so he told the daughter that your mother has gone to join goddess durga and they're fighting covid together but now what to do about he was so broken he didn't he couldn't go and perform he couldn't go and cremate his wife and he couldn't go and bury his 6 month child the group of muslim volunteers then stepped in to do that and he said this is now my brother i have i have a new brother so whether it was you know hindu homes where a lot of homemakers i met said we don't know how to help but we decided we'll just cook five extra rotis today in our kitchens five extra rotis if we cook four rotis we'll cook five more and they were collected in housing societies in a plastic bag at the end of the day and taken to a migrant camp or they were muslim volunteers i or in the second wave people turned to each other for oxygen or it was our gurdwaras where uh, normally kada prasad is distributed in langars but this time oxygen langars were held i i wanted to capture not just the sorrow but the strength of us as people i wanted to capture not just our broken hearts but also our compassion and i wanted to say that you know what's going to happen to our children uh, we haven't even begun to analyze yet how the children's cognitive social and emotional skills have been hurt all of you who are parents must have seen this happen to your children and in rural india you had girls under renewed pressure to get married at the age of 9 10 11 12 because there were no schools and their parents had no money and they would say ab aap shaadi kar lo go just go so you know it just percolated down it changed us there was none no one left untouched and so why did i write the book i wrote the book because just like in the war it was about the human stories of the soldiers in the pandemic for me this was the story of our people the people of the pandemic which is all of us so seeing the migration crisis uh, so closely yeah how difficult and challenging has your experience been and do you want to um, say any of the challenging experience that you faced during coverage of this so there were there were many challenges right yeah. the first challenge was how did i get people to care about this my biggest challenge was that i am used to hardship in the field i'm used to being in situations where there's no way to sleep no food to eat i don't know if i'm going to be safe i i am a journalist who's covered war and insurgency and conflict for almost all my journalistic career so that didn't disturb me as much as you see people were so scared in the first wave that to get them to care about anything outside the immediate reality was very difficult and my uh, digital platform mojo story is primarily now we've expanded into other languages but it started off very much as an english uh, platform and english as you know was our socio economic class now our socio economic class was also ravaged by the pandemic so how was i going to get people to care about the fact that hundreds of thousands of people were walking home in the heat sometimes by moonlight without food sometimes barefoot and 
I think what I discovered was that I had to be a really powerful storyteller to get people to care. You see, in the end, I always say this to young, budding journalists. I say, one, our job is not as glamorous as it looks from Dur se. The other thing is, in the end, we are not NGOs. We are not activists. We are storytellers. We have to tell a powerful story to get people to care. We have to be very, very powerful communication specialists. And so the biggest challenge I faced was, how do I get a person who, yes, is suffering, but is so busy battling their own reality right now to care about the reality of a poor person right now. And that was my biggest challenge. Logistical challenges, of course, was, you know, at every state border, we were stopped from entering. At every state border, I had to fight to get a district collector to give me permission. All of hotels like this were deserted. But to get to stay in a hotel like this, I needed special permission of the district magistrate. Uh, then you know how our systems are, the DM says yes, the SP doesn't know, the SP says yes, somebody else doesn't know. In every state I would have to call the chief minister's office and say please can you talk to somebody to let me in across the border. You know, so there were a lot of logistical nightmares. Of course there was the fact that when we first set off, we didn't even know that COVID was airborne. We used to wear gloves because that time we thought it's from surface and all those strange QR codes and all which we don't need. We didn't know it was airborne then. And, uh, you know, PPEs, I mean, I'll tell you a hardship. You know, the PPE kit, which now we know is, by the way, not even necessary. But we all had to wear it then when I would go into hospitals. I would come out and I would be sick every time I wore the PPE. And I couldn't understand why I was sick. And I then started talking to nurses and doctors and basically understood. One nurse told me, it was a sad story that... She said that, you know, when I go home, my children don't want to meet me because my hands smell of plastic. Because all day long I've been in that plastic of the PPE. Another said, you know, the oxygen supply gets interrupted to the brain. It really disturbs you emotionally. A third nurse, I'll tell you an incredible story. And it's in the book. This nurse was in the hospital where on the night of 26-11, Ajmal Kasab, while on the run from the Mumbai police, he was one of the 10 terrorists who, of course, laid siege to the city of Bombay. He had stormed in with his AK-47s into this hospital, Kama Hospital. And he was running from the police, so he took refuge in this hospital. And this nurse was on duty in the neonatal ward, which means she was looking after new mothers and their little infants. And in came Kasab with his AK-47. And she was like, what do I do now? So she basically turned off all the lights and said, we'll just pretend there's nobody here, just be quiet. Then she said, oh my God, someone's phone is going to ring. So she confiscated, she had, the, she had the foresight to confiscate all the phones, turn them off, turn the lights off, just turn them off. And they somehow managed to survive. Kasab came right up till the lift outside their ward. I have seen that lift and burst bullet holes. With the, 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 the lift still wears the pock marks of that hole. This nurse's name was Yogita. And Yogita told me, she said, you know, I found it easier to deal with 2611 than COVID. Because 2611 had a beginning and an end. It ended. COVID, and I'd of course met her at the, you know, in the middle of the second wave. She said, I don't think it's going to end. I don't know when it'll end. And this, this sense of there being like the horizon, the inability to see the end of something, she actually found dealing with a terrorist now with the benefit of hindsight because she said it had a finite end. So, you know, the hardships were many, but I mean, I think they were all worth it in the end. So before I move over, I would like to read a small paragraph from the chapter Five Girls and a Funeral, yes. which touched my heart. Yes. So they carried their father on their slender shoulders, distributing the weight of the body on the stretcher made from bamboo and leaves between the five of them. At five years old, Jyoti, the littlest among them, really just ran alongside the four older girls. Like what are your views on this, Bharka, and when you wrote about this? Yeah. So one of the things that we haven't spoken enough about is that we forgot that other illnesses existed in these two years. People were still dying from kidney disease, heart failure, cancer, tuberculosis. And because initially, we got better by the second wave, but initially... All of our hospitals were, and our medical system was totally taken over by COVID. If you were ill from some other disease, 
you had no nowhere to go and if you were ill and poor and your only recourse was the public health system you really had nowhere to go so this story called five girls in a funeral uh, is of course borrowed from the movie four weddings in a funeral so it's five girls in a funeral and it tells the story of all of those who battled other diseases and this story is uh, about uh, the family of a tea vendor who used to sell tea sanjay his name was sanjay and when i say he used to tell tea i mean he just had a little shack hole in the wall where he used to sell his chai from and he was a tb patient and he had five daughters and when he got ill he tried to get a doctor's appointment he couldn't he went to the hospital the hosp public hospital had been taken over by covid patients so he went back and he managed and after a few weeks he felt very ill and his family tried to call him an ambulance and of course there was no ambulance available and by the way one year later uh, one of the reasons that my father actually died is because i had to hire a private ambulance for him to take him to the hospital and that private ambulance was not an ambulance but actually a maruti van that had been repurposed as an ambulance it didn't have any paramedics it had one driver and it had one giant oxygen cylinder laid on the back of the floor and uh, basically by the time we got my dad to the hospital uh, the cylinder had not functioned as it had to so his oxygen levels had plummeted and i i remember this because now when i look back this family was trying to call an ambulance and they couldn't find an ambulance but there were no ambulances that's how i remember my father's story because there were no ambulances so you had all of these moonlighters functioning as ambulances which weren't professional ambulances and of course sanjay didn't make it and i went to meet the family of sanjay and there were five girls and you know in our custom traditionally it's the men who carry the stretcher the men who carry the hearse the men you know the women typically conventionally don't even go to the cremation ground or the graveyard but in this case five daughters had to cremate their father and so the chapter opens with their story but of course then goes into the stories of you know i remember meeting a a a, a terminally ill cancer patient who basically was the hospital she was admitted to it was taken over by covid she was asked to go home because actually there was nothing that could be done the doctors felt to save her and they said ab you go home because we need these beds for covid patients so you know i also look at what happened to all those who had other illnesses but they were not covid where did they all go you know and um, you shifted actually from a full time journalism um to setting up an independent digital media the mojo story which recently backed the asian digital media award too so what urged you to make the switch so firstly this is more full time than my tv <laughs> job um two three things one is i got disillusioned with tv i didn't like the direction it had taken i think it became less and less about people less and less about reporting and more and more about you know these kind of debates where you know the most extreme voices are invited and they're made to fight with each other it was almost news as theater um to i felt that i had also in fact the book opens with me talking about my own journey but i had also maybe become a little lazy you know i got so used to being comfortable in a comfortable studio in a comfortable organization that even i had lost my connect with people i i i always saw myself as a people's person and i felt like i was losing that connection and thirdly quite honestly i did not want to be an employee anymore i wanted to own my own little corner of the universe however small that corner was or however big it can become and so at the end of 2019 i just decided mojo means magic so i just decided that i had to find the magic of journalism again i had to remind myself what i loved about this profession and so uh, was launched mojo and mojo story and it so happened that october 2019 is when i start working on mojo and one after the other there is just this crazy new cycle so it starts with citizenship uh legist protest against the new citizenship legislation then i live in delhi we had delhi riots and then we were in the pandemic so one after the other after the other after the other i was just reporting and i love reporting but that's all i was doing and so that took us through two and a half years i mean right till omicron and then of course i wrote my book but we went from 
we started with some 20 30000 subscribers on our youtube channel and we are above 800000 subscribers today we uh, hope to reach a million i think in the next 2 3 months is my target uh, we've just launched our website we're a video first because i'm I, you know i'm from the visual storytelling medium but we hope to hit a million uh, pretty soon and um, you know what i feel freer i feel like myself uh, i like the feeling of not having a boss of course it comes with a lot of responsibilities because you're suddenly responsible for your team we started with four people we are 21 people now um and uh, you know we just won all these awards that you said to be recognized in infancy as the best digital uh, platform twice in a row uh, won a gold at uh, the you know world newspaper uh, world publishers association which you mentioned but more than that i think it's being able to do journalism that resonates with people yes it will take a little bit of time i still go somewhere and people will say where are you these days there will be a certain generation which will say where are you these days and i always say just go to google google mojo barkha you will find me uh, it's not difficult to find me but usually that question comes from people who are not active online uh, so you know anyone who's online knows what i do uh, and knows very much that i have embraced my first love again which is to do journalism that can change the lives of people and make a difference to the lives of people so journalism is actually the foundation of the free society yes so a lot of journalists nowadays are like being put on trial in the court for their public opinion or often lose their jobs for their jobs uh, i mean for their posts and the columns so where are we headed in terms of the credibility of media nowadays so it's a very interesting question you know wherever i go nobody says a good thing about media right so especially about television and they say oh you know tv and in some ways i share that's one of the reasons i left tv i don't identify with the way tv news has become in our country but i always say that you know when you say trp what is trp you know people say oh tv tv's become all about trp and i say that's true but do you know what trp stands for it stands for a television rating point what is a television rating point it's how many people on a given day are watching a particular channel so it's so absurd that even let's say you leave your tv on one day and you forget to turn it off and you have a a box that measures trps you've accepted that box that channel will spike i mean i'm just saying what i'm trying to say is the trp is made by all of you so if there is actually journalism that you don't like you have the power to reject it that doesn't mean that we in the media are not responsible for the decline in quality we're very responsible which is why you will see in the last 2 3 years so many stalwarts of television have actually left to do their own thing so many if you if you care to see where did all those people go that some of you grew up watching on television you'll find so many of them are now in the digital space because they feel freer in that space but i think we have to understand that what happens to the media concerns not just us but all of you it is intrinsic to the future of our country to the shape of our society to the nature of our democracy and i always say to people that one of the reasons that tv has become what it has it has a broken revenue model it takes a lot of money to run a tv channel and so only big business houses today are able to run tv channels and independent media houses count on the direct subscription of their readers or their viewers so if you really want the journalism you believe in it's quite simple you'll have to pay a little bit for the news you believe in right you pay for your tata sky script subscription without even thinking about it you pay for your newspapers without even opening them some days for the price of one starbucks coffee a month you can fund a digital platform that you like that's as sort of cheap the subscriptions are i mean at the minimum level of course you can pay more if you want to but that is how much you know for 300 bu- if you support if you put 300 rupees per month in a digital platform you are doing your bit and do it it doesn't have to be me it can be somebody you like if you don't like what i do find somebody you like but support independent journalism because these are people who are trying to build build themselves outside the shadows of corporate houses government advertising right they're literally dependent on their subscriptions from all of you 
So I just feel like if we all are invested in the future of the media because it concerns us all, the quality of the media will also change. Very well said. Uh, let me ask you a personal question. How good does it feel given that a biopic is made? Which actor would be the best fit to play your character? <laughs> So, two, uh, so firstly, every time I see a journalist on screen, I'll see that actor giving an interview saying, oh, I modeled myself on Barkha. And when I see the film, I see nothing of myself in that character. So I don't know what they have done. So whether it is Preeti Zinta and Lux, who was actually called Romela Datta, which was set in the Kargil War, no one killed Jessica with Rani Mukherjee, but I didn't see myself in this. And to be honest, I think if there ever is a biopic, I have always said that, in my opinion, the most talented actor of her generation is Alia Bhatt. So I would very much choose her to, I also recently interviewed her and you know, I've interviewed her many times and I have a sense of her and I think she's a very, very fine actor because she seems like this young, young girl who won't be able to get into the depth of many different characters and then when you see her on screen, she's completely different from what she is in real life and that's the art of being an actor. That's nice. So, Barka, being in this profession is very challenging and all the more for being a woman. What is your message to all the budding youngsters who want to pursue this profession, um, journalism? So, I think my biggest message, I have two messages, one for budding journalists and one for women in general. So, for budding journalists, my message is, this is not glamorous in the way that it looks to you from afar. If you really want to make a mark, if you really want to be more than one more presenter who wears good clothes, looks good and sits in front of a camera. There are, there are many of those, but the, they, those are not the ones, men or women, who's, who will leave a mark. The people who will leave a mark, who will leave a legacy are people who have touched the hearts of people. And for that, you have to take risks. You often, your life will be in danger. Sometimes you have to go into places where there are no clean sheets, where there are cockroaches and rats in your room. I can't remember. I, can't, I mean, there were so many. I can't count the number of nights I've spent in the last two years in places and I'm terrified of rats where I've seen a rat under my bread, a cockroach in the bathroom, no water to have a bath, uh, you know, no, no loo. So if you really want to be a journalist, be a journalist if you really, really love it because this is not a structured uh, 9 to 5 job. This is a profession that asks passion, curiosity and a certain appetite for a risk taking from you. So do it if you love it. If you don't love it, find something else you love. And my other message to women in general with apologies to the men in the room is that I meet a number of women and I always ask them, please raise your hand if you have followed your dreams or have you curtailed your dreams for someone else? Have you curtailed your dream for your parents, for your children, for your partner? And invariably, a majority of women will say, yes, we have curtailed our dreams. And somehow we have romanticized the idea of women and sacrifice. And I think it's about time we stop romanticizing sacrifice. And though it's a controversial thing to say, I always tell to women, Please be a little more selfish. You know, the younger people today have a phrase called YOLO, you only live once, right? Um, I see so many mothers in particular trying to live out their dreams through their daughters, saying, you know, what we were stopped from doing, we will ensure our daughters don't have to be. We'll raise better sons. We'll raise sons who will treat girls as equals. And that's all very well. But it's never too late to not have regrets. You're never too old to not have regrets. So to, to the women in this room in particular, um, you do only live once and please stop holding yourself back. This starts early in our homes from women eating at the end to women placing food before their husbands and their children before they eat. And it cuts across classes that women are asked to curtail dreams. And I'm here to say that it's never too late to live your dream. Fantastic. So now the floor is open for the audience for the questions. You can ask the questions to Parga. Hi. Um, Hi. I'm Nidhi. Hi, Nidhi. So just to start off with, uh, being here is one of the reasons, like you rightly said, you know, do something for your own self. Someone very rightly told me once, every day do just one thing just for yourself and for no, no one else. Yes. And that would, you know, start off. So this is one of the things coming here. Oh, thank Anyways, you. so... Um, a very interesting thing comes to my mind when you say that, you know, you go out there for the stories and you are the storyteller. But being a woman, I mean, if I were to place myself in your situation, 
the most difficult part would be to keep my emotions, my sentiments, and to keep aside the feeling of, you know, being there to help others, you know. Yeah. Let the story be a part, but then, you know, help in help the helpless and be there in the this thing you know how do you manage that situation it's very difficult uh, you know being a journalist and doing yeah. this thing so nidhi that's a great question and i'll answer it very honestly uh, by one saying that a lot of times you know when i was doing these reports for example on the migrant workers i was asked well, why didn't you put them in your car right now my car i did 30000 kilometers in a maruti ertiga in which there were four people and our gloves, our PP kits, our Dettol, our Sabo and our shoes and there was no room. But even had there been room, right? Of course, where we could help, we did. Every story we did, we had a bank account uh, number of the person we were reporting on and we would encourage our viewers and our readers, please donate directly to this family. Where we had food, we would give food. Where we had pani, we would give pani. But structurally, by carrying one family 200 kilometers ahead, am I going to be able to change the lives of 100 million migrant workers that were impacted in the, in the pandemic? No. But structurally, if my reportage is used by lawyers who are petitioning the Supreme Court, then I can achieve a structural uh, change. So I handed over all the footage I had. Everything that any lawyer who did a public interest petition, I said, here, 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 get the Supreme Court to issue directions. And finally, the Supreme Court issued directions for special trains, for the workers to be sent home, and so on. Can I keep my emotion apart? Not always. What I am trained to do, and it's come after many, many decades of doing some very uh, difficult reporting, I'm trained to be functional. Please understand that I'm a visual storyteller, which means that at a precise moment, I have to get the shot, the interview, that moment, be cogent, say something myself, ask a cogent question that is not insensitive. So I have a functionality, but I don't hesitate to let it break. In Kargil, I didn't cry because I thought they'd say, it's a girl, she's a girl, she's crying. And I had to really fight hard to get that assignment. In COVID, I cried freely. I cried with people, I hugged them when they cried, I cried, we cried together, we laughed together, we ate together. It was an extraordinary time. You know, I met an old woman outside a railway station in Mumbai called Leela Vati. She was 70 years old. She'd been abandoned by her son. He'd thrown her out of the house and said, go, I don't have money to look after you. She's a widow. She had nowhere to go. I found her desolate outside a railway station where I'd gone to cover some other story. And she took hold of my hand and she wept and she said, I have nowhere to go. And I wept with her because how could I not? And no social distance. What, what are you going to say? Social distancing? Some old woman, poor woman is crying on the street. So, of course, we did the story. Indian Railways put her on a train. I said, what will you do when you go to Delhi? She said, I'll beg. Somebody adopted her. It was a happy ending, right? Every story doesn't have a happy ending. I've been trying for the last two months to get justice for a woman in Punjab who was burnt. She's pregnant with twins, she was burnt by her husband. Burnt. And I interviewed her with a burnt face. So, I mean, I've seen this. I'm trying for two months to get something for her. I'm not able to do it. So every story of yours doesn't lead to change. But do I keep my emotions out of it? I have now reached that point in my life where I'm comfortable enough in my own skin that I show my emotions. And I sometimes get judged for it. Sometimes people say, why, why are you emoting? You should have been more controlled. But I've also understood, you know, I, I was interviewing Hillary Clinton once and she told me, you know, Barkha, as women, we have to understand if we're in the public eye, we have to grow skins as thick as the hide of a rhinoceros. So I know that no matter what I do, somebody will have an opinion. I can't be looking over my shoulder at other people's opinions. I have to just be true to myself. So I have learned as I grow older to get more comfortable with my emotions. So I don't leave my emotion out of the story. I just carry my emotion into the story now. Hello, I'm Arjuna here, ma'am. I would like to know why suddenly on media, the Susan Singh case was suppressed. It was hyped like anything and they were coming up with the justice, with the victims. And all of a sudden, they just turned the full topic and it was suppressed. And yet you can read on the newspapers and all, the sisters are asking for justice and they're saying the government, the media, the journalists, nobody has done justice to it. So anything to say about it? Um, I have a different perspective on this case. I believe okay. that it was hyped 
in okay. a way where television studios became judge jury and executioner i have no idea i think he died very tragically i was out reporting covid so i have no idea how he died but i don't agree with the kind of journalism that has been done both you know at that time what happened you just decided the entire film industry was evil today the same channels are chasing the same industry for interviews for whatever yeah. so there's an essential hollowness in that process when we make a charge against somebody if you think you know th th now the point is agencies have ruled out for foul play they say it was a suicide now if you want to say that he was killed you have to be able to prove it you can't base it on your own conjecture it's a very serious thing to say when you say somebody's been killed and i actually am very disturbed by the kind of journalism that is practiced these days that apne aap we decide like we have cops what is murder what is suicide who is guilty who is innocent so with respect ma'am i have a i don't know what's being suppressed because frankly my two years have been in covid i didn't really Come. report this story but i'm very in on principle and uncomfortable with guilt and innocence being you know pronounced by television anchors i don't know who's guilty do you do you know we don't know because we were trying to reach i mean that there was an ambulance person who had come to pick up his body he said ki i does not look like a murder the doctors were there who said ki it looks like a murder so we don't know it was a big dilemma going on but the doctors on. eventually didn't say that right the doctors eventually said it was a suicide the best yeah. i have followed the no case. the first thing they have the first time they had said but when they were going the brief this thing so yeah. it goes yes yes please yeah uh <clears throat> barkha ji you mentioned that you have become disillusioned with television you also mentioned about your colleagues i guess people like vikram chandra and even print journalists like shekhar gupta etc they Everybody have all they have all gone into the digital. digital space so what i wanted to ask you was do you think we have reached a point of no return for I mean, television yes is the credibility going to be plummeting more and more and more and i have also come across many analysts who say that it is also correlated with the kind of divisive regime that we have in delhi how they are breaking institutions how they are polarizing so at some point in time when there is a regime change do you think credibility can be regained and things will be good again so firstly i believe that all politicians want to control the media irrespective of their ideology so even if you see at state levels you see an attempt to curtail uh, freedom of press across parties people are uh, this is the instinct of the politician the instinct of the journalist must be to resist that irrespective of whether it happens at the state level or whether it happens at the central level i do believe that you cannot transfer the responsibility for what tv channels are doing onto politicians you cannot do it we are responsible for ourselves we are responsible for what we do when a channel decides to run a hashtag called corona jihad in the middle of a pandemic has anyone asked him to do that no no one has rung up that channel and said ye hashtag lagao who somebody has decided on their own steam that let us do this somebody has decided on their own steam that every day let us create a fight in this country by inviting the most bigoted hindu and the most bigoted muslim and let us get them to fight with each other why where why don't channels invite real people who are able to sit around a table and have maybe a disagreement but in a friendly way and a robust so do i think tv has created an enabling environment for hate very much but do i think that we as journalists can blame politicians for what we are doing our lapses i don't think so i think we are responsible for the choices we make has television reached a point of no return i do think that i don't remember the last time i switched on a television i don't know about you all but i watch anything i watch on my phone or on my laptop and that gives me hope that there is space whether it's a vikram whether it's a shekhar whether it's me whether it's a fade souza you look at the number of people who have walked out of television anubha both people have walked out of television so i will take the conversation back to where i started in the question about the media that if you are disillusioned with the media support the media you believe in don't just lament So do something to support the people you believe in. Barkha ji, Faiz Khan, Hi. hello, Barkha ji. It's always a pleasure to be a Good part of your event. Good to see you event. again. Yes, absolutely, ma'am. We miss you out here in Hyderabad. Uh, I was delighted when Anjum told me about you coming over to you know Hyderabad. A uh, couple of things, you know, we miss you. You know, uh, we have a handful of people, Pranay, 
Rajdeep, Aap, and Kapful Fathers, you know, who really miss on the, you know, we miss you, of course, we still see Pranoy and others. The thing is, ma'am, today when you open your television sets, uh, you see a very unhappy country. You know, a person visiting from abroad checks into a hotel, he goes through, you know, news channels of ours. You see all of us being very unhappy, fighting, in, you know, temperaments, you know, uh, you know, moods and all that, mood swings and all that, and the way we kind of blame each other for it. So I, don't you think that we need to put our foot, uh, foot down, journalists like you, people like you, and see to that we weather the storm rather than, you know, moving out. That's one thing, ma'am. Secondly, talking about you, I would like to tell you about one 90-year-old gentleman, uh, Mr. Mahmoud bin Muhammad, he was an IPS officer, no ordinary person. He was handpicked by Mrs. Indira Gandhi back then as DGP, as her personal the person in Delhi, ambassador to Arabia and uh, United Nations. He was a fan of yours at 90. And you know what he used to say after you did your Kargil and everything? No other person, but she deserves a Bharat Ratna. So that is something that I'd like to actually, a very prominent person which Bhai knows about. That's so yeah. sweet. I like, that's very sweet and very heartwarming. Thank you. But I want to answer the first part. You see, what you're saying would be true if I had left journalism. When you say you should stay there and fight, that's exactly what I've done. I, ha I have, in fact, you know, you say you miss me. I urge you every evening at between 5 and 6, there's a live show on the Mojo Story platform. Please watch it. Please subscribe to it. Please watch our reports. Please support us. I would agree with you of putting our foot down. If I had left and was growing, you know, roses in some bush in, on some hill, I am very much an active journalist. I am very much there every day. I am very much raising my voice on the issues I care about. I need all of you to support the kind of work that I'm doing. I haven't gone anywhere. I'm right here. So you don't have to miss me. You just have to watch me on a different platform. Sir. It's a pity this is not May because 3rd of May, as you know, is International Day of Journalism. Yes. And one of the hits in that session, international organization, was uh, a four minute clip on journalism under digital siege. Yes. Now, you've given us some of the pictures, and I think following the trace of your mother right up to Kargil yourself. There's a continuity of compassion in a passion in a field where women were almost eliminated and where you've had 400 deaths in the last few years. So going out into the field and grabbing and yeah. turning something into an emotional is quite a feat. So perhaps that is one of the ways we, you can get back your audiences which are lost to journalism yes. through their disappointment. It is not the media which should be accused, but unfortunately the organizations of yes. the media. As you know, the biggest media organization is CNN at the moment. Yes. How they have said, now stop this, uh, they, you know, the leadership in CNN has changed. Yes. And they want to get back to your sort of human approach rather than debates, yes. where, which is uh, uh, alternative information or uh, wrong information, Absolutely. right? So how to do it? Because people like you are isolated. Yes. And you can bring up with your 10,000, how much have you got now at the moment, uh, on the YouTube? 800,000. 800,000. So you started with, uh, I think, eight. you know, you, you want to get to one uh, more than that. Yeah, exactly. So that is a base. Yes. Those are your actors. Uh, this, what is your role in this context? Because you brought in the gender concept, Me Too movement. Yes. Now, have you abandoned that? Are you part of it? Since most of you, your organizations, I wouldn't say you've been harassing me to attend, but you've been very efficient in getting the audience to attend. You see, to make sure that we don't make empty promises, that we do live up to our commitment. Yes. Now, how does Me Too movement fit into this, to br not to break up the Sita image, hmm. because Sita is still an ideal, for a, uh, a cultural ideal for an Indian woman, but how do we evolve this? What is your relationship with educational institutions? Because that is how you're going to change yeah. society. So there are a number of questions there. Uh, one, I would say I agree with I'm you. Sorry, I, 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 I agree with you on how there needs to be much more human approach to content and not these debates, because debates by definition will be theatrical and shallow. So that's on that front. Uh, on the Me Too movement, I think it's a complex conversation. It was an inflection point that enabled women to break 
the silence was something that they had been encouraged or pressured to be silent about historically for decades. And uh, it's complicated because we believe in due process, but here we were saying that you don't have to follow due process, you can still speak. So I think women had to be very, you know, for example, I didn't, uh, when I had to choose which stories of Me Too to highlight and which not to, anonymous complaints were not something that I, I agreed to because I felt that if you were going to speak and name somebody else, you needed to be able to, at least to me, after that the law requires me to protect your identity if needed, but I had to know who you were. You couldn't write me an anonymous email, not tell me who you were and make an allegation about somebody. I believe that it was, uh, it was or it is an, inf a f an inflection point in furthering a conversation. It is not an end in itself. It was a means to widen a conversation on an issue which had remained buried in layers of silence. You know, even in our homes, if a girl is harassed, if a woman is harassed, she's encouraged to not speak. And I think we have to recognize that the essence of Me Too was to encourage women to speak. That said, there is no substitute, in my opinion, uh, for eventually believing in the legal system, you know, uh, and, and because otherwise you get into this sort of free-for-all where actually after a lot of noise, nothing happens to the person you, you've accused, uh, you know, they file countersuits, we've just seen a very high-profile Johnny Depp and Amber Heard uh, trial take place. So I think we have to see Me Too for its essence and not for its literalism. Its essence was to encourage women to not remain silent. Uh, on the last point of whether one feels isolated, I think all of us feel isolated in different ways today in, in, in our reality. Everything is so noisy around us, uh, you know, everything is so polarized. If you watch television, you think nobody, I think as you said, that if somebody's just flicking channels, they think, oh, this country is always at war with itself. But I actually find that if you go off TV and you go off Twitter and you meet in gatherings like this, you'll find people are able to talk to each other, you know. There is still a India that is not left or right. There is still an India that sits in shades of the center. And I think that is the India we must hold on to and we must be part of and we must amplify. And you know, sometimes when I do my shows in the evening, and as I said on Mojo's story, we live stream every evening, people tell me, oh, you know, Barkha, you're very boring because you never call these extreme voices. I consciously do not call extreme voices because I'm interested in having a genuine conversation. I don't want to have a ladai. Banai hui, manufactured ladai. So I think that there's so many of us who feel isolated that we're an army by ourselves, so we don't have to feel isolated. Thank you. How are we on time? So yeah. it's six o'clock. Yeah. If I may ask the last yes, question. Please. We have um, a very large number of educationists yes. in the room, yes. and uh, maybe a message just from what you have seen um, yes. at the ground level. I'm so glad you reminded me of that. <laughs> so, so just, I mean, because we are in the, um, you know, in, in the field of, you know, uh, nurturing the future generation. And these are going to be, you know, citizens um, of an increasingly complex world. Um, any thoughts or advice for the educationists in the room and also, you know, the other adults, we all have children. Most of us all have children. So for the next generation, yeah, what is yeah. it that we can do to equip them? So first, we need to get out of the shadows of the last two years. The most devastating consequence of the pandemic has been in the education sector. By, and I, I mean, I think it, it was an undertold story. What teachers went through, what principals went through, what children went through. I have closely looked at surveys that show that children have lost social skills, cognitive skills, language skills, right? Uh, there's also health factors, kids becoming obese, not being active enough. So you're going to have a doubly tough couple of years ahead of you because you're going to have to first repair the damage that was done. Secondly, what are you going to do about the millions of poor children who fell out of the education system? Who is going to count them? Who is going to look after them, right? In rural India, you had literally millions of children who just fell out of the school system. In particular, girls. You're going to have to think very hard about the girl child. Many little girls have been pushed into marriages that they didn't want, uh, that they have fought. I did a story, the stories in the book on a village in Rajasthan where the girls fought so hard. The parents kept saying, what will you do? You're not going to school, get married. So they formed a football team. 
and they learned how to play football and they just used football as a way to assert their their independence uh, so you know you guys have a very challenging few years ahead of you and you need to find ways to mend sort of these bruised and they're invisible bruises you know you can to treat a bruise that is visible is still doable but to treat an invisible bruise jo dikhta nahi hai but has happened to the child how the child has internalized it the child who doesn't have a classroom or a school to go today uh, parents who had to pull out children from schools because they couldn't when classes went digital they couldn't pay for laptops in this city i must share a story with you i did a story on a young girl if i'm not wrong her name was eshwarya she uh, she was the daughter of an auto driver an auto mechanic and he sold everything he had to educate his daughter she studied in lady shri ram college in delhi lady shri ram college went online she was sent home she didn't have money for a laptop she took her own life i did that story and um, ktr saw the story and he promised me that he would give financial help to the family so that the younger sister could be educated but it is a reminder that for people who don't have money education is everything for them and for them to feel that they can't access that education right so i think a lot of psychological bruises are going to have to be addressed and finally of course how you what you say to kids you know we've spoken about uh, polarization hate mongering hate politics divisive politics let's go back to the diversity that makes this country what it is it is in the classroom it is in that classroom that you have to sow the seeds of that diversity being so intrinsic that they can never think any other way irrespective of which government is in power and which party is in power it is there that you will shape at a time when we feel that you know we are getting divided as people it is in the classrooms that you must bring us together again thank you thank you barka for Thank you, Barka, for such an interesting, heartful session. Now I request uh, our SAS women, Ms. Manthi Malik, to give the oath of thanks. That was an absolutely engrossing talk, Barka. It was such a pleasure to hear from you at this cherishing event of the Right Circle in Hyderabad. Thank you, Ms. Tath, for sharing your experiences as a journalist and a reportage from insurgencies and war zones. The way you covered human story of pandemic on road and recorded it in your book deserves a huge applause. <laughs> Kudos for being the fearless female force that you have been. On behalf of Prabha Khitan Foundation, I, Ahsas Woman Mansi Malik, would like to express my sincere gratitude to Ms. Barkha Dutt and Ms. Maria Boda. I take this opportunity to acknowledge our patron, Shri Simmons Limited, our venue and hospitality partner, ITC Kohinoor, and the amazing literary enthusiasts of Hyderabad. That is all of you. Now I request Mr. Jayesh Ranjan, Principal Secretary for Industries and Commerce and Industry. IT to felicitate Ms. Barkha Dutt with a Madhubani shawl. I also request my fellow ASAS women, Ms. Anjum Babu Khan and Maurya Voda to join for a picture. <laughs> 